So today, I want to speak on uh, an issue or a thought here in the scriptures that I think will really bless you, and I want you to hear what God wants to say to you. The reality is that if you speak with anybody for any length of time about their story, and they open up to you, and you build trust, you're going to find that at a certain moment, somebody's going to share some things that are more difficult for them to share. They're going to, if they get vulnerable, if they get a sense that they can trust, they're going to share some things that maybe have been stuffed down. They're under the surface. They wouldn't be known if you just simply said, how are you doing? What is your name? Great day outside. Hey, you know, how was your week? There's a depth that I believe is happening here at Capital Life Church We see it in these Monday nights with some of the discussions that are happening and and the relationships that are coming about, that the Holy Spirit is really moving in some ways that we don't have to stuff things down. We can be set free. We know the one who sets people free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But very rarely will people go to a place where they'll talk about their hurts, the moments where maybe there's some things that just sting to talk about, or there's shame involved with it, or maybe it's not shame, but it's just a situation that's difficult to talk about, so it's left unspoken. I want to speak from 2 Kings right now in the fifth chapter. This story is a, is a pretty interesting story that we read, and it's a story that I believe that we can really draw from today. The Bible says, starting with the first verse, now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. Now, Aram is actually modern-day Syria. He was a great man, this Naaman, in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and, um, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. Uh, In uh, modern-day terms, financially, this would be of a value of $1.2 million. The letter that he took to the king of Israel, in other words, that speaks to the desperate nature of him wanting to be healed. He would be willing to give what would be of value to him. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, quote, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Could you imagine if you got a letter like that? I'm sending cousin so-and-so to you, to your home, so that cousin so-and-so can be cured of what they have going on what's going on in their lives, whatever it may be, physical or otherwise. And this is the type of letter that comes. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel quarrel with me. And this speaks to the tensions in that area of the world that are still there. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Now, Elisha, by the way, that we're about to read, uh, that we're about, that we're reading about uh, here, is actually a prophet of God. Now, Elisha is the successor to Elijah, and his ministry had supernatural miracles happening left and right. So we know that many, many miracles were happening through this Elisha. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. 
And Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. And Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed, So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. So a fascinating story that we read here. I always like to consider what it would be like if we could just transport somehow miraculously from right here on Glebe Road in Arlington, Virginia, back thousands of years to this situation and see this at the Jordan River and actually spar with this story by smelling the smells and feeling the sense of the wind and hearing the voices that are being spoken so that we can understand the power of what was really taking place here. The story has within it two kings. We see two kings. We see a great warrior commander. That's Naaman. We see a prophet, Elisha. And we see a servant girl. Naaman only introduced, is, is only introduced in the fifth chapter of the second, uh, of second Kings. Uh, he was, we read, a valiant soldier. And that's interesting as we read about him and all the good accolades, but his highs and his lows are found and summed up in one sentence. He was a valiant soldier, but... He had leprosy. And so I've entitled my message today, Life is Great, but secrets and wounds can be found in even the most respected families. There was a a, a campaign, an advertising campaign of Nike years ago in which Nike presented to us that image is everything. And so if we can just fake it, if we can smile and say everything's all right, what's our most often heard response when we say, how are you doing? Fine. Are we? As we've been going through these Monday nights, people end up pulling me aside or Lisa or our family or others that are helping to lead in what is happening at Love Does in order to talk to us about the areas in which we would get to that Little word, three-letter word, but. It's a word that all of a sudden you feel like life is going one direction, and that little word all of a sudden makes it go a fully different direction than the direction you thought you were going. And our most common response to things, in all honesty, is to do what I mentioned a moment ago, and that is just stuff it down and pretend like everything's all right and like it's all going to go away. But if there's any place in which you ought to be able to be set free, it's the church. You are surrounded by those who believe in a powerful God. You are surrounded by those who love you enough to say, I'll stand in the gap with you, for you. I will pray with you. I will, I mean, we had the prayer partners on either side just a moment ago. I'll be in agreement with you. I want to see you get through to your true identity and it's not attached to that lowest denominator in your life. God, the Bible says, is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the author and the finisher, not that circumstance, not what happened to you, not that thing you wish could have been written some other way in your life. And in verse one, the Bible says that Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram, again, of Syria. He's a great man, highly regarded. Uh, We know that he had uh, victories. And so he was a good commander. There was a good response, Uh, not true of other people like maybe Custer or others at the very end good of this man. And we see a further glimpse into his life, and that is to look into the meaning of his name. Now, I don't know if you really think much about the meaning of names, and nowadays we don't think about it to the same degree as 
in Bible days where there would be significance to it. When we named our daughters, uh, Aubrey, uh, the name Aubrey means, does anybody know? Ruler of the elf people. That's what she, if you look it up, that's what they say the meaning is. And she's been trying to rule her little sisters ever since. And then Taylor, our middle girl, Taylor means seamstress. And Sydney is a place in Australia. So you can see that we don't necessarily always name, you know, with a depth of meaning. But in Bible days, that was definitely there. And Naaman's name means, are you ready? Charm. Pleasantness. I like that. All these accolades. Life is great. But and all of a sudden, that sense of a turn. It easily reduces what we know about him as this great commander, this great person of victory. And it reduces all of life's joys and accomplishments to that one low place. But he had Leprosy. That word leprosy would strike fear in those of the day. It was a skin disorder. And it was also beyond being something physical. It was a social disease because if you had leprosy, you lost your dignity. You could not be around people without calling out unclean. Now imagine everywhere you go, you have to say unclean. I knew a couple of college roommates. I could have yelled that out wherever they went, but, but they didn't yell it out. Okay. <laughs> the first service didn't get that, so enjoy that. Um, in Naaman's case, it's not likely that it was the full-blown leprosy that we think of today. Uh, when we look back to you know, Bible days, uh, it was not likely the fully disfigurement full disfigurement of the body. It was not likely that he had already gotten to the stage uh, of having all of his nervous system basically destroyed and shut down. I say this because he's not barred from contact with others at this point in the story, and he's still active in his role. That tells me that it's possibly the beginning of what he knows will be the disfigurement and the rest of it, or it may be some other situation that he has, but it's enough for him to be willing to pay $1.2 million in value. It's enough, enough for him to get desperate about. Luke 4.27 says these words, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. Only Naaman, the Syrian, not one of them was cleansed. There are those not one Moments of life. In other words, that we start to look at it and say, well, not one. My family has gotten the college degree. Not one. And the marriages I can think of in my family truly had love in them. Not one. Whatever it may be. But God excels in those not one moments to show his power. We don't have to hunker down and just take what the enemy wants to give to us. Can I hear an amen to that? Those not one moments. 2 Kings 5, 2 through 3, and we read it just a moment ago. But we see uh, in those verses there, uh, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And all of a sudden, I start to think for a moment that there are those that look at this story and they say it's about Naaman. Well, it is about Naaman, but I wonder if the primary pers person in this story, really, it isn't about the kings. And really, maybe it's not even fully about Elisha or about Naaman. Maybe the focus here is on this little girl whose name we won't know this side of heaven. She's anonymous. She's a servant girl. But if that little conjunctive word of three letters, but took things a direction in regard to a valiant commander, but he had leprosy, is it possible that that same little cognitive word could be brought in here with what she begins to do? He had leprosy, but he can go to the prophet. 
He had leprosy, but I've got hope and I want to share it. I think of how it is in history. You know, many of you know that one of my heroes of the faith is Billy Graham, the evangelist who passed away in this uh, last year. Billy Graham's name was not a household name before 1949 with the big meetings that took place. He came underneath that tent. It's the same tent my father used. They both used the same tent. And my dad was an evangelist as well. My dad was in those meetings. That's a side point, but I'm proud of it. Billy Graham was there in those meetings. And all of a sudden, William Randolph Hearst, the great publisher who had newspapers all around the globe, was very, very wealthy. William Randolph Hearst made, was there in those meetings. Hearst, as far as we know, was never in the meetings. If he was there, he came incognito. There's nothing about William Randolph Hearst that would say that he had a genuine interest in God in any way. In fact, I can tell you things that would be quite the opposite. There's nothing to show that he is interested in the gospel message and wants it to go forward. Nothing. But there was a maid of William Randolph Hearst, a servant of William Randolph Hearst that was there in those meetings, and she knew she was strategically placed by God because she went to William Randolph Hearst, and the next thing you know, Hearst is promoting the Graham meetings and what he's preaching all around the globe. It was a famous telegram in which William Randolph Hearst put out to all of his papers, Puff Graham. It's two words, Puff Graham, and immediately headlines about what Billy Graham was doing, so that the gospel ended up going all around the globe for decades through that ministry. I believe that this unknown servant girl was placed by God to be there. And I believe that she was filled with the Spirit of God. She knew who she was. She knew who God was. She knew why she was there. And she was not intimidated to speak up. And to bring hope into a situation that otherwise may not have had hope. You have the ability to do the same thing. You have the ability to stir up Holy Spirit activity wherever you speak. Wherever your feet go. Wherever your presence is. I want you to know that you have that ability. Let's stir it up, folks. Let's do it. I want to speak to those of you that serve here at Capital Life Church. Because you serve. Now, you have some of you titles, job descriptions, I'm telling you, that would put people at awe to know what you do out here. And You serve. You serve your church, and you're faithful in what you do. Can I tell you something right now, speaking to those who are serving here at Capital Life Church in some capacity, or you have in the past? I want you to know that because of what you have done, people have come to Jesus this month. Instead of the direction going the direction of hell... If I can be as bold as to say it, we don't preach about hell in churches anymore. There's that switch from that direction to going to heaven because you are serving here at Capital Life Church. Because of those, and I've seen the faces of you out here as I've been preaching right now, that have been leaders here on Monday nights at Love Does. I look out, see leaders of C3, leaders of our men's ministry. Women's ministry, listen, because of what you're doing, I can tell you the depth of what the Holy Spirit is doing here at Capital Life Church is increasing. That's so vital that you guys know that. Don't ever think that somebody else will speak up. Somebody else will show the love. Somebody else will do it. Get in there and be a part of what you do. And this young lady inspires me because I see in her no need for fame which is way beyond what it should be in our culture. We think that if somebody is famous, then their political opinion counts more than others, or their opinion on fashion, or whatever it may be. Hey, if the Kardashians say it, or if they wear it, or whatever it may be. But the reality is, image isn't everything. And God places, at times, individuals that we don't know the name of, and there are those, I'm telling you, they come on the scene for a brief moment. We don't even know where they came from. We don't even know where they're going. There's no record of it in Scripture on those two sides. All we know is this unnamed individual just shook a leader of a nation and shook an entire nation. God's not about our fame. 
God is about us being obedient and being faithful, and we have no idea what that will trigger. All of a sudden, this unnamed girl begins to get things in another direction, and I would love to know more about her. I have never seen a book on that maid of William Randolph Hearst, but I'm telling you, she took things another direction, and so can you. The Holy Spirit is at work. Can you say amen? The Holy Spirit, oh my goodness, it's like what was said last Sunday, Aslan's on the move, isn't he? Meaning Jesus, for those of you that don't know Narnia. Let's give God glory. Let's give God glory. You know, the Bible says, if we don't praise him, the stones are going to shout out. You know, even creation declares that God is alive and good. We need to be those who are not ashamed and we're bold in what we do. We'll go to a ball game. We'll be all excited. We'll look like fools at a ball game. But boy, we'll come to church. We'll be all sedate and sober. Listen, I understand respect, but I believe there's a moment at which you don't care what it looks like. It's full throttle. It's all your heart. You want to give God everything and in every way. And so we see this one again who steps out and she does her part. Now, we see also in the seventh verse of that fifth chapter, as we look at it, uh, we read the, the scriptures say, seventh verse, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. The reality is, even the doctors couldn't cure him. And here are these kings, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're getting frustrated and figuring that there must be some ulterior motives in it. And Elisha says, you bring him to me. I want it to be known that there's a prophet in the land. And there are those with faith, and there are those with either pretended faith or no faith, but I'd always rather go to somebody who, when they pray for me, believes that God is listening. I'd always rather when I'm in need, maybe I'm in the hospital or whatever it is, I want people around me to believe that God is a miracle working God. Those are the ones I want surrounded by. If anything ever happens to me, don't bring in the naysayers. I want the ones who are going to believe for God to move. This is who you are. I'm telling you who you are. Maybe you've forgotten who you are, but I want you to know God is in the, on the move in your life. God is writing your story. You are a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. Say amen if you believe it. God is on the move in your life. And then we see the rest of the story written out here in the 10th through the 14th verses again. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times, that seven times being the number of completeness, in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. Wait a second. Pastor, didn't you just say his name means charm and pleasantness and now he's angry and he's raged and all of this? What's going on? But isn't that true of us? There are moments in which when we lose sight of who God really is and who we are before him and our true identity with him, and we, when we get our eyes on all our circumstances, we start to get callous. We start getting to a place where we don't talk about God in the tender and respectful terms we used to. But God is still that awesome God. God is still that loving God and all-powerful God. And so here, it's as if he goes against his own identity of charm and pleasantness, of this wonderful commander who's doing great things, and he finds himself enraged and not acting like who he really is. Sometimes we go through seasons, and that's a flag immediately to recognize that God needs to have your heart, and we need to get back to that winter period. Remember when we talked about seasons and being right there in our foundation being built up again? Something's happened to Naaman, and he's gotten prideful now. He seems angry, and your pride cannot meet God's provision. You're going to have to humble yourself if you want God to truly show up in the way that we dream of and pray for. We miss our miracles when we see tasks as beneath us. He saw the dipping in the Jordan as beneath him. There are two rivers that are cleaner water. 
and they're back where I'm from in Syria. Why should I dip here in the muddy Jordan? It seemed beneath him. There are moments in which we think it seemed beneath me to ask for prayer. It seemed beneath me to walk over to somebody and say, I need somebody to hear my story right now. I need somebody to pray for me. But remember, God meets us in our humility. Verse 13, we see those servants, unnamed, immediately step up and begin to speak to Naaman when he's at his most prideful. And they speak to him to a degree to where you recognize that they must have moral authority in his life to speak to him in the way in which uh, they did and in the way in which he responded. Again, there's got to be somebody with moral authority who says, I'm a Christian and takes the name of Jesus. There's got to be authenticity somewhere. There's got to be a man in here that prays, not out of tradition, but knowing who your God is. There must be a woman in here that knows how to pray and meet God in that prayer for breakthrough to happen for someone else. There's got to be somebody who knows the word of God and won't limit God in our day and age to be whittled down to some finite man-made God, little G, that I don't know. That God's too small. The God I know is the God that King David served. And King David said, come magnify the Lord with me in the midst of all the conversations who would like to make him small. Come magnify the Lord with me. Who wants to see him as big? Who wants to know him as the miracle worker? Who wants to be healed? Who wants to be set free? It goes beyond meeting like a club. Clubs meet, Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, all the clubs meet. No power of God necessarily there. It's not a social club here. You may find a social circle. I hope you do. There comes a moment where we either want to live for him or we don't. He spits out the lukewarm. Oh, but he's so loving. Certainly he. He just savors the lukewarm. The Bible doesn't say it. Religion's going to get me to God. No, it won't. We can't reach God. Religion's trying to reach God. You can't reach God. God reached out through his son. That's the only way is a relationship with Jesus. No denomination, no church, as great as it is. None of these things are going to get to you to heaven. It's a relationship with Jesus. We'll be shaped and strengthened in that relationship with Jesus in the church. But the church attendance won't do it. Being on the worship team won't do it. Having a reverend in front of your name won't do it. It's a relationship with the Lord Jesus. You dip seven times. And when you do it, you're going to have skin that's brand new. And it all sounds so simple, doesn't it? Dip seven times, you've got to be kidding. What is this dip seven times? He didn't come and speak over me. He didn't do these things. I didn't even see Elisha. He sent a messenger. What do you mean? That's too simple. I can't embrace the idea of the simplicity of that. In the same way, we get to the place where we think, I can't embrace the simplicity that my prayers can shape a nation. Yet they can. That simplicity of church attendance being with fellow believers and and learning the word of God together and praying together. I can't accept that that's going to change anything, but that's the only thing that's ever eternally changed anywhere is when believers believed in a God that's on the move in the now and that they are junior partners with that. Stand to your feet, if you will. I want to pray for you. It all seems too simple at points. He'll get the flesh of a young boy when he dips and when he honors the words that were spoken by the prophet. But I think that something much greater happened than just simply that he was healed of his leprosy, as great as that is, and knowing how horrible leprosy is. I believe that something beyond a physical healing happened. I think he was healed on the inside. And I believe that all of a sudden he looked at God different. And all of a sudden he looked at himself different than others. Life is great, 
But if I'm to be honest, I need God's touch right now. I need to be healed of something that hurts. Being a pastor, I find it, you know, I talk with an individual for any length of time. It seems like all of a sudden there's that sense of I'm with the pastor. I need to, if I'm going to get a breakthrough, maybe now is the moment. Be in a group discussion. Pastor's here. Let's get vulnerable. I think we ought to be all of us like that. Carriers, the good news of the gospel that you're not reduced down to the lowest denominator in your life or to the greatest moment of shame or of hurt, abuse. Please hear me when I say it. Some will embrace this by faith and be changed. Others, they're just words until we go off to lunch. The Bible says that wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many, many there be that go in there at, but narrow the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. Yet I think the world is presented to us a religion that's palatable to all of us, but God that doesn't look for holiness. Of all roads lead to heaven, not wanting to offend anybody by saying, there's something very unique about this Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No woman comes to the Father except through me. I want to be popular. I don't want to embrace that. Well, then you've made your decision. But if you, in a loving way, will live out your faith, you will change the lives of others.